this article from the guardian was released i think a, well, a couple of a few days ago it's been shared a few times and it's really interesting because it kind of speaks upon something that i think a lot of people are familiar with if you've been out in the east london scene especially around you know the whole hacking week warehouse area or some of the stuff that's been happening with the part party in the parks and stuff and what are they called what's that bloody team called again uh keep on going or keep on going or keep it going wherever the, those people are that do those forest raids that used to happen in the summer last year so if you're familiar with that scene that you would know that this is, should be no surprise but this is a really uh, cool way to kind of encapsulate it with the story from the guardian uh it's a club culture it's called um the it's i will get, again i'll link it in the comments for you listening via the podcast app or if you're watching you want to read it later um it's called austerity gentrification and big tunes why legal raves are flourishing and this is from the guardian um i'll just quickly get up here on the screen and we can read it through and then talk about some of the topics that are at hand so it says here um amid disillusionment with mainstream clubbing legal events are harking back to the original spirit of rave but police maintain that they're dangerous and criminals ever of course the police would say that though wouldn't they right the police, the same people that are kind of trying to limit any kind of fun, right? That t- they take they take joy out of ruining fun. That's the thing I, I hate about the police in the UK. They really enjoy locking down parties and kind of ending things. Um, but anyway, let's continue. Um, so it's an hour after midnight um, on New Year's Day, 2020, and a stream of revelers are gathering in an alleyway next to KFC on London's Old Kent Road. They pass between piles of car tyres and par- and through a gap in a gate where a group wrapped in hats and scarves are taking five pound notes from each person who enters the yard on a recently abandoned car carpet right warehouse. Inside the lights are on, the groups of party goers are huddled in groups, talking, waiting and smoking at a Bayonworth sound system and makeshift bar constructed against one wall. Next door in a larger abandoned warehouse that was formerly an office outlet, an even bigger sound system is being built. There is a sense of anticipation as the warehouse fills up with a mohawked punks, tracksuit squatters, crusties and rude boys, accountants, graphic designers, students and grey-haired veteran techno heads. Everyone has come together looking for the same thing, a night of loud music and dancing without the constraints of the regulated club culture. No closing time, no dress code, no age limit, no searches on the door. Which is essentially the problem in it that we have. I think um, I've said it ad nauseum on here before, but I guess the issue is never really the fact that these things are not happening. It's just that f- the more interesting things are happening way outside the fringes, right? They're happening um, under the noses of some of the people who probably should need to go, right? People that should probably have that kind of experience who are coming to London and sense of going to like an authentic clubbing experience. I haven't been subjected to, you know, dreadful nights out in Liverpool Street, Soho, Shoreditch, Dawson now because it's kind of got, gone a bit tits up. And those places were good before but you know they were good because they were an alternative to what was going on on the fringes now that they've kind of turned into these kind of you know uh clubbing or bar versions of pret a manger or pret a manger how you fucking pronounce that place right <laughs> um then they're no longer worth going anymore and now what's happened is that those same people still exist that's the issue that i've, that I've never understood like you can close as many clubs as you want down in london you can deny people to go out in certain places. You can, you know, have, you know, 17 fucking werewolves standing outside of fabric, right? And, and you know, security guards that shove their hand up your asshole, right? You can do all that stuff, but those people that are going to be, that are going to be put off by going there, they still exist. They don't suddenly die. So where do you think they're going to go? They're not going to suddenly turn into monks and refuse to go outside anymore. They're just going to put on events for themselves that they're going to enjoy. But then the problem with those events is that the, the events are going to be in unregulated spaces. There's not going to be any health and safety measures put into place. There's going to be um, all sorts of people being let in because there will, there will be no turning away on the door. There's no door picking, right? If you if you put, if you go and hire a warehouse somewhere in the middle of Old Kent Road and all you and your friends chip in 500 quid each, that's a lot of money. You want to uh, you want to make your money back. So it's not likely that you're going to then turn people away at the door. You're going to receive any five pound you get. It doesn't matter where the five pound comes from or who it comes from. If it comes from a very shifty looking dealer who you have no idea who he is and he ends up coming in and selling people pills that are laced with fentanyl, then look what happens. Look, who, look what happens. What's the issue there? You have revelers dying in your warehouse party that you set up with you and your friends. But then look at the reason that this has happened. Go back in time. It's the local councils. It's the lack of movement or lack of kind of foresight or kind of, uh, I don't know, vision when it comes to the nights are. 
this is stuff that's going on in the London Mayor. Loads of in, loads of kind of missing links have kind of led to the situation that we're in now, where essentially people are willing in London, especially, are willing to risk their safety, their health, right, to go and rave somewhere in a dingy warehouse somewhere, un, like, you know, whatever, doing whatever, just because they can't put up with going out on another night in Liverpool Street Station or Shoreditch or whatever, maybe they just can't put up with it. They'd rather risk their life trying to have some sort of, you know, authentic fun. Then go to these kind of other places. And again, I have sympathy with it. I totally do. But let's continue with the article here. Um, in recent years, unlicensed underground raves like these, which are run by decentralized networks and self sound systems and party crews, have flourished across the UK. As legitimate club nights have founded uh, in the face of Tigger, sorry, t- Tigger, tighter licensing requirements and population of young people with less disposable income. In September, the drum and bass producer Goldie, who was awarded the MBE for his services in music 2016, signaled out, singled out illegal uh, parties such as these key uh, pillars of the UK dance music scene amid struggle of clubs and increasing corporate festivals. Uh, Goldie says, I played an illegal rave in, forest, in a forest last night in Blackburn. Those kids are brilliant. Their love for music is pure. Raving culture ain't, ain't, culture ain't anything you put in a weekend festival, he said. Rave culture is thriving, but an underground level. People want to go to fucking raves. People want to go to legal parties. Which is true. Again, I would I would argue that people don't actually want to go to them. I would argue that they've got no other option. I think that's what I would say with that one. Um, Brian G, another Hall of Fame drum and bass DJ, started playing reggae at South London squat parties in early, early 80s when he was 16. Today he's in his 50s and still plays along occasionally at unlicensed raves despite regularly DJing for crowds of over 7,000 people at legitimate commercial venues. He says, I've turned up to the unlicensed parties over the last couple of years and been shocked by the numbers, he says. Some club nights spend a ton of money on advertising and can't pull in anything like the numbers that they're getting at events. Which is true, but that's not really, a, that's a kind of false correlation, isn't it? Because even though, you know, you might not get the numbers that you want at a fucking X or Y, but at least you've got the, you know, at least you're in, at least you're kind of safe in the knowledge that you can go take a shit, right? You can wash your hands, you can have a piss. You can go out to a smoking area, right? I don't think there's much of a smoking area in a dingy warehouse somewhere in the middle of Forest Gate. But then on the flip side, you do have the um, possibility of actually discovering new interesting DJs, meeting interesting people, uh, having a memorable experience that you're going to remember. You know, as much as I love XOYO, it's not the most, you know, it's not like a bucket list uh, requirement or goal to go to, right? Whilst you're in London. But imagine you stumble across a warehouse party somewhere, right? In the middle of fucking Manor House. And you're like, oh my God, this is sick. And you see, you know, the whole um, range of freaky people that come out on a night out in London. That's going to be something that's going to be way, way up more up your alley than anything else. So I definitely see the the pull of it. And again, having been to many myself, I know exactly where they're coming from. I just, I just wish we weren't in this position. I just wish we had the ability to have more places or clubs or spaces where people could go and get weird on the weekend right that was you know they had warm warm running water air conditioning heating good lighting decent security guards like i wish we had those things in place so that we weren't pushed to these kind of avenues because as much as as much as it's creative and it's amazing there's also the idea that all it takes is one death or this is one injury for the government to kind of really force the hammer down and completely lock them all up because there is part of me that's sort of like a lot of the cops probably let it go or the councils let it go because you know maybe it does kind of help their bottom line their uh, you know kids come in for the warehouse party they spend money at the flipping mcdonald's or the fucking kebab just around the corner or the off license kind of win-win police officers don't really want to go around running after a bunch of young people who are high off drugs right that's you know there's if there's one person you don't want to chase down the street somewhere it's a meth head right <laughs> or somebody has been on a couple of tea has been a, a couple of e-tablets like that's the worst type of person they've got the best endurance ever so maybe there is a bit of like you know what we're just going to turn a blind eye allow them to have their party and then lock it off at a reasonable time quote unquote right but again i'm very worried that it just takes one unfortunate event for the hammer to come down on everyone and then what anyway um it continues since the 80s the illegal rave scene has always been 
active on some level, says John, not his real name, a member of the prolific London-based Free Party crew. There's no coincidence that the original boom in Acid House Free Parties took place at the decade of Tory government headed by Margaret Thatcher. It's still here now, and the current political climate is one reason why it's healthier than it's been in a long time. But it's funny you mentioned Margaret Thatcher. Have you heard the story that supposedly um, that era um was the the reason why we kind of you know our situation now we are in, we are now with illegal rapes was that supposedly during the fracture era some mp or some you know um highfalutin um abdi abdi blue blood type person um complained to margaret fracture's government because their property or you know they had like this big farm somewhere in the middle of the country that was uh taken over by ravers um and they complained uh went ballistic over the fact and then that one incident is basically what essentially kind of kabushed the whole rave scene in the uk for the most part because it wasn't obviously it wasn't only limited to london it was kind of taking you know to got taking place all across the uk for the most part i think it even started outside the uk if i'm pretty sure and it kind of made its way down to the south so that one event at you know unlucky for the fucking ravers right the illegal raver promoters who put the event on the one place they go put the you know their rave on that person has to be happens to have a direct line of communication to margaret thatcher complains to mummy and then she locks every single uh, rave down completely and now in situation we're in now where you know in some london in most london venues actually in, in london this is not even i don't know nothing to do with this but this probably is attached to it but in most london venues of weatherspoons you don't get a dj in other weather spoons outside of London, you do get a DJ. Makes no sense. Anyway, um, let's continue here. The last couple of years have been have seen scores of unlicensed events um, across the country, from five thousand strong mega raves in Bristol warehouses to three day breakout sound clashes on the South Coast beaches to intimate sidetrack parties in the woodlands of Lancashire and multi rig technivals. I love that on Scottish wind farms. Like John, many of these involved in the free party scene it believe that there are these events are becoming more important than ever amid the widening social divides and going the Tory austerity and the creeping gentrification. 100% agree with that. The free party veteran and the uh, acid techno innovator Chris Liberator says that unlicensed raves are a way for people to take back control of their local areas and even if it's only for one night. 100% because the risk reward system isn't great especially for people putting it on. There's obviously the the kind of glory right the project x glory way i think in project X is a good example he's reluctant to have anyone around his house and it kind of gets out of control but it's a memorable party and this one dorky dude ends up being like you know he knows he's he's kind of etched his name into history regardless of what happens regardless of his parents disown him he goes to prison he's he's kind of you know he's immortalized himself in the memory of all his people so there may be a part of that in a lot of these promoters for these warehouse parties where they're like, you know what, even if this gets locked off in an hour, the fact that I've did it is enough anyway, right? It's kind of, you've already won because you've did this thing, right? You've kind of gone around, you've been on Google Maps the whole day, looking at places, trying to find units. You found one, the electricity is still running on it, or you've got in touch with the land, with the kind of the key holder. You slipped him a couple hundred quid and you've let the rave run. That's, that's epic. Um, so it says here, um, we're, we're culturally in a place where normal people can't control the environment at all, he says. I've seen the best pubs in my area turn into Starbucks, which is awful. Humongous, big... Co- and again, this is the issue that we're having, isn't it? Like, imagine being in a local pub, right, somewhere in your area. Shit, not shitty area, but it's, let's say it's Homerton, right? What's the point of turning my local pub in Homerton where some of my local friends who happen to be producers, happen to be artists or DJs, can play every weekend? Why turn that into like a a pub, a pub bar chain right into a brew dog or into like a pret or a starbucks what is the point of that there's no need just keep it independent keep it small allow that bar manager to have a license that takes them over maybe you know 4 a.m a couple of times a month so they can then go so they did it to, and then because it's a local bar there's no pressure for them to kind of book you know Steph trucks to come play in the local bar in homerton he can afford to go and let daisy and her friends to come and DJ on a night out because, and then if, if even if no one knows her, no one comes because it's, it's a local neighborhood bar. But then through effort, through promotion, through marketing, and through you know uh, just regularly playing, those girls cultivate an audience. They cultivate a little scene, a little community, and then boom, guess what? We have another hub. And I've always argued that in a weird way, even though they think gentrification adds to the area, like you know, in a gentr- in a gentrifier's mind, when Hacking Wick blows up, if I'm thinking just like 
again, because you just kind of think, if you're thinking just like a straight capitalist, right? You're thinking like, if Hacking Week is blowing up because of warehouse raids, right? You somehow think in your head that your prêt manger customers have an overlap with people that go to warehouse raids. There's not really much of an overlap apart from, you know, if they're hungry, they might buy a sandwich. But for the most part, you know, they're going to be very health conscious. They might not have a lot of money anyway. They might have a lot of, they, they might have some preconceived ideas or notions or they might have a very strong position against buying in places like that anyway. So there's not much comp correlation apart from, you know, if they're hungry, they're humans, they might be hungry. But I guess if you're a capitalist in that way, you're like, you know what, I didn't put a prêt manger there because then the same traffic that's going to these clubs will come to my prêt manger. But it doesn't work like that, right? Like, if anything, um, you're going to get more people coming to your shitty club or restaurant, wherever it is, if you allow that little independent spot, little independent pub, bar, nightclub in Homerton to operate, which is then going to allow those people to have a place to go to, a safe haven. So if they decide that they want to come to your shiny, you know, scent-filled, uh, shitty music playing pub somewhere in the middle of Soho, they can come. They can, but they, have, they they make constitution to come. The fact that they're turning all the clubs, all the bars, all the things into these kind of sterile environments that don't inspire anyone, right? It's just it defeats the purpose. It doesn't make any sense. And it, and and then the people that would go to these kind of naff places, right? The kind of quote unquote normies. Like, they don't want to see each other in a bar. They want to kind of go there and feel cool. They want to see the weirdos and the freaks. But they're nowhere to be found because they wouldn't be called dead in there. So it's, a, it's just a strange, strange situation to be in. Like, very, very strange looking at it from the outside. Like, I, I wonder what the end goal is with these things. But anyway, um, there's no space for people to live. It says here continues, uh, let alone to throw events and have some fun with their uh, on their own terms. There's very little cultural representation for anyone apart from the mainstream. And even the mainstream clubs are struggling to stay open. Police, though, maintain that these events are a significant risk to the public order and public safety, in the words of Metropolitan Police Service Commander Dave Musker, boo, who is the national leader of unlicensed music events. Imagine that being, imagine that being your role, though, the lead for the unlicensed music events. Imagine how hard that would job that is. <laughs> Fuck me. He describes them as illegal. It's as illegal, dangerous gatherings that encourage antisocial behavior and are linked to a serious criminal activity. Yeah, a serious criminal activity that's always a misnomer. Man. Every warehouse rave I've been to, the most trouble there's been at a warehouse rave is people arguing about who's got change for five so they can buy balloons, right? Like, let's relax. No one's really fighting or getting to that much hassle, really, for the most part. They're quite self regulated. You know what's, ha- what's really interesting, the warehouse parties? They're probably the most well-behaved places because for the most part, people are just chuffed to be there, right? You don't really get these kind of genuine um, rave experiences anymore, especially if you weren't from that era. You just might, you might read about it in books and stuff, but to kind of actually experience a proper, like, not, I'm not talking about the ones where it's like, you know, it's in like a studio somewhere where they, you know, where they shoot ID magazine. I'm talking about a proper warehouse where it's like, you know, this place was covered in, it's still covered in piss, but someone just decided to throw a party here like a genuine place that wasn't ever made to have humans in it let alone people dancing right um to to finally be in a place like that so right people that are like-minded you feel chuffed and you don't want to fuck it up so people are quite well behaved though, to be honest i have to, I have to admit, people are very, very well behaved um and as that organizers are changing the structure of their parties to counter police tactics understandably he refuses to detail those tactics on the site <laughs> By 3 a.m., hundreds of people have filled the dimly lit warehouse. The giant system is spreading out, gut gut shutting, set of base heavy jungle, and the walls are covered in increasingly dense patchwork of graffiti tags. That's interesting, too, I found. Most warehouse parties are quite dub, reggae, uh, drum and bass, jungle kind of infused. I guess it's probably because of the origins, but it's interesting to me that you don't really get many like warehouse parties that are like techno house based. There are a few, don't get me wrong, promotions out there, but most of it is dub, reggae jungle for the most if and if it's up to me to be fair i would prefer to go to a place like that and listen to that kind of music if i want to hear techno if i want to hear house i know where to go to but if i want to get a bit weird right listen to some trance some acid you'd know where to go to um it continues here um the, the, the graffiti tags a heavy mass of ravers are thrashing and embracing on the thickly carpeted dance floor in front of the speaker stack around them uh, are signs that say 20 percent off 1000 of one thousand spans of carpets in an area of austerity the unlicensed rave scene offers people a low price alternative to illegal clubs but that's not the main life that's not the main reason people attend 
according to Sophie Dunyam, one half of the underground electronic music uh, duo My Bad Sister, which started out and seeing at Level Raves, it offers people a chance to it offers people a chance where they can come together as a community without prejudice and without intimidation, she says. Uh, people are risking arrest just to create a space where people can come together, no matter who they are. In a country where pe- social divides are increasing, what the Tory government and all the governments want to do is isolate people so that they can control them. When communities are united, they're stronger and they can't be pushed around, which is definitely true. But it's interesting to see, to think that a, a space, a warehouse spaces are kind of being built as safe spaces for people to go and club and have a good time, in, especially in the UK. But then in most clubs in the UK, especially if you're from the LGBTQ plus side of things, you'd say that most clubs in the UK aren't the most safe spaces for you, right? You're kind of pushing for more codes of conduct, more on-site help and stuff to kind of you know curtail maybe you know handsy patrons and shit it's interesting isn't it that you would you would think to be the other way around you'd think the warehouse rows would be the where you know people would be loosey-goosey and doing whatever but actually there's more accountability in warehouse parties because for the most part everyone's everyone's there for the right reasons right love of music love of the scene when to connect when to you know, take part and just be around. And just be around, isn't it? That's weird. It's just sometimes people don't even care about music. They just want to be where the energy is at. Um, but then maybe clubs, you know, there's kind of conflict and interest at play when people are going there. Anyway, continues here. Uh, Duniam says um, that the ability of clubs and festivals to provide a smaller space, a similar space, sorry, for free expression, has been curtailed in recent years due to the stringent attitudes towards license agreements. I definitely agree. Drug-related uh, incidents have led to the closure of several clubs in recent years, including the Arches, who choose to be located in Glasgow. Imagine all these clubs. In, it might, it's fair enough, London is bad enough, but Glasgow and Edinburgh, like, um, the, I imagine there's not many that come there anyway. What is the point? Like, there's a lot of tourism there. You're obviously some people are obviously going to come for the to, for the you know clubbing tourism. Why not just keep it open as another stream of revenue income? It makes absolutely no sense. Anyway. Um, the Arches, which used to be located in Glasgow and had its nightclub uh, license revoked 2015 after the death of an Andre Clubber. In 2016, the London Super Club Fabric also saw license taken away for five months following the death of two 18 year olds after taking drugs from the premises. It reopened in 2017 with stricter security regulations. It's like 1920 prohibition in America, Daniel says, a legal club in scene. When we perform at Fabric, all the punters are searched and have their passports photocopied before they're allowed onto the club. And you can get chucked out for having a vape. That is insane, man. It, imagine what kind of state that puts you in. Going to an electronic music event, right? A dance music event late at night, right? And you're being you're being searched with sniffer dogs around you. You're being groped and pushed around by some big buddy security. Because the security are fabric. They don't fuck around, man. And then your passport is getting scanned in, like... Many believe that the rave scene is filling a void left after a decline in grassroots venues defined by the mayor of London's office as those that focus mainly on music and playing an important role in local communities and hub of musicians. In July, figures revealed that there were only 100 grassroots music venues in the capital, 5% fewer than 2007. Mama Mia, representative of a nationwide decline, the Government Select Committee report published in 2019 warned that the closure of music venues represents a significant and urgent challenge to the UK's music industry and cultural relevancy. There's a original picture here from Ashworth in 1989. Amazing. Love the ball cut. Interesting that the fashion here is still quite on point, isn't it? <laughs> um, the Bristol-based DJ and producer of the record label, uh, Madid Terex, Madid Terex, who started her career DJing at free parties in the 80,000s in Buckinghamshire, says the innovative the innovation that happens in the underground is what fuels the commercial scene. She also believes that the UK squat party scene offers a unique space for people to come together. She says, as a transgender woman, I've been to two different people. I've been two different people in the rave scene and I've been uh, openly welcomed throughout the whole thing. You get every single walk of life there. It's 10 a.m. on Old Cape Road, New Year's Day. A flood of new people entered the former office outlet warehouse, which takes place in the office block in the South Bank. As the pale morning light streams through the skylight, hundreds of ravers are dancing to the hard track dreams of DJ and their falls bounce bright. A man with a wild head of grey hair is cutting intricate lines throughout the, prefer- the, the peripheries of a crowd of a pair of roller skates swooping inches away from their teenagers asleep on the dance floor wrapped in a large yellow store closing sign. Since the original boom in the asset parties, in the late 80s, the unlicensed rave scene has been the target of media stories, scare stories, of course. 
uh, after drug overdose and violence. But many of these uh, regular attendants said that they feel safer than they would do legal attend legal clubs, which I mentioned previously. Someone says here parties take place without a problem every weekend. Sedonium comparing them with licensed events where people are kicked out at four in the morning or early if they have done something to piss off security. If you see a teenage girl and you haven't got money for a cab and the train starts not running until six or seven in the morning, being thrown out to leave you in a very vulnerable position. This would never happen in legal raids where no one is getting paid to look after anyone. Everyone is out looking after each other as a community. Awesome. Wow, 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 wow. A beach wave in South Coast in August. This will be the last bit here. The, the, this is the gross reputation according to... I've been attending legal raids for more than 20 years, says Madid Terex. Attending hundreds of illegal parties and I've never seen any violence. Any I have seen has actually come from the presence of police. If you go down any high street on a Saturday night, you see bars, brawls, and fights on the street. If you go to a rave, no one's fighting. Everyone is there to have a good time. Occasionally, you get a few bad people, but nine times out of ten, they are marched out of the rave as soon as they start something wrong. The raving carpet right at least passes off without incident by 9 p.m. The, the last of the equipment is picked up into vans while a handful of remaining party goes sit around a small fire in the yard of the warehouse. Some are discussing the Tory campaign pledge to change the law of trespass and give police new powers to arrest people. Wow. So it went all the way until the next day, 9 p.m. No problems. They picked up the equipment and went away. Honestly, a really illuminated um, article. I think if you're part of the dance music scene, especially in the UK, and you feel a bit frustrated with things. I think it's quite a cool um, and encouraging article. It kind of speaks about the things that we've kind of all gone through and kind of offers some solutions, kind of, you know, reading between the lines. But again, for the people that have kind of been against the race scene, again, it's probably a reminder of like, you know, just how important these things are for young people, man. Like a safe haven. I can just imagine nowadays it's easier for me because I'm older and I have more disposable income. I can essentially go and get that kind of feeling somewhere else right i could fly to berlin fly to amsterdam fly to barcelona fly to madrid and stuff and have a good time go to you know go to georgia right i could i could do that but if you're young if you're a younger person you don't have that kind of disposable income and you want to just you know meet cool people in your local city in your small town that you live in this is the only way you're going to do it by these by attending these legal raids and the more the more kind of strain they put on clubs which is weird because they want to dissuade kids from going to clubs to get drunk and get high and have fun but then they're pushing them more in the direction of these illegal raves and these legal raves for the most part are run by great people honestly everyone i've been to i've had no problem people that spoke about here seem pretty legit but there is also the uh, there is also the op the kind of potential of kind of you know manev uh, bad things happening right and you know what how this government is right you know how shit we are with things like it always takes one incident suddenly the whole thing is over so i hope Kids are inspired to do these events, put on their own, but also are inspired to look after each other, innit? That's the main thing, I think, with scenes and DDS sports. I remember I mentioned somebody when I went to Fold for the first time. I was blown away at how amazing Fold was. I remember saying to somebody drunkenly in the toilet sometimes, like, we really need to look after each other in this space. We need to make sure that they have no incidents, right? Especially, like, severe incidents of, like, drug overdoses, all those kind of things, right? Look after everyone because the moment something bad happens in here, we're all going to be kind of punished, by the government, right? They're gonna take us a chance to kind of shut it down and teach us all our lessons. So, yeah, it's a great article, um, great scene, um, blooming there, and good, good to see kind of the kids kind of going out and kind of making something happen for themselves, right? Not kind of bemoaning what's happening and complaining, but actually making a change for themselves.